Good morning, church. Our sermon today is going to be on John 13. That's the chapter that John uses to talk about the Last Supper. But he specifically talks about the foot washing service that the Lord instituted. So we're going to have two hymns this morning that sing about that subject and teach us some things that we may not have thought about. This first hymn is number 401, An Imitation Lord of Thee. And interestingly, this hymn is only found in Seventh-day Adventist hymnals. It was in the 1886 Hymns and Tunes, and it's in our current hymnal too. Number 401, An Imitation Lord of Thee. Consecrates the humblest act. Love consecrates the humblest act. gives us the truth of covering our sinful selves with the righteousness of Christ. Look upon Jesus, sinless is he, Father in beauty, his life unto me. My life. 
life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life, whiter than snow, covered with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know, my life of scarlet, my sin and woe, covered with his life, whiter than snow. Deep are the wounds transgression has made, red are the stains, my soul is afraid. Oh, to be covered, Jesus with from the law that now judges me, covered with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I know, my life of scarlet, my sin and Longing the joy of pardon to know, Jesus holds out a robe white as snow. Lord, I accept it, leaving my own. Gladly I wear thy pure life alone, covered with shall I know my life of scarlet my sin and woe cover with his life whiter than snow reconciled by his death for my sin justified by his life pure and clean, sanctified by obeying his word, glorified when returneth my Lord, covered with his life, whiter than snow, fullness of his life, then shall I My sin and woe, cover with his life, whiter than snow. Good morning. In uh, Psalm 122, verse 1, in the Psalm of David, I think about this all the time on Sabbath morning, it says, I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so my prayer this morning is that all of you will have a chance, if you haven't already, to rejoice in the house of the Lord. We're glad that you're here. Um, we are so thankful that you've decided to come worship with us this morning. Uh, if you take a look at your program, our church is doing a lot of really cool stuff. So if you turn to the section that says news you need to know, I just want to highlight a couple of the things here. On April 1st at 6.30 p.m., right here kind of on the other side of the youth chapel, we are going to be having a hot dog roast. So bring chairs, sticks, and any picnic sides that you want to bring. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have vespers. Uh, I'm going to be helping out with music. So it's just going to be a time to unwind, relax, get to know each other, have some fun. 
Uh, we wanted to have a huge thank you for those of you that had part in uh, Kayla and my baby shower this last Sunday. Um, Debbie has a thank you in the bulletin. My wife and I did not get a written note in the bulletin, but we just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for supporting us. We are so blessed. We were talking about this on the way home that day. We are just so blessed to have such a supportive and loving community to, bring, to help bring our baby boy into this world. So thank you so much for that support. Um, and now I am going to call up Sherilyn, who has... <laughs> It's going to be a little bit more lively than my announcements. I have a sneaking suspicion. Well, I don't think that's how it's supposed to go. We were, we were going to have a couple of lyrics of our theme song. But I wanted to just bring to your attention, we're having spring. Do you want to play it? There we go. That's it doesn't have to be that loud. Okay. Yeah, you can turn it down a bit. So Zoomerang is going to start April 8th here. It's an evening vacation Bible school. So I was supposed to say good day, mates, but that music threw me off. But anyway, it's going to be so much fun. Um, we're going to go to Australia with the kids, and we're going to have some featured special animals. The koalas are going to be there, and we're going to have... Oh, we're going to have kangaroos there, of course. Not necessarily really hopping around, but the boys and girls will be hopping around. It's all about the theme of this um, special vacation Bible school will be all about creation, and it's going to be about how God made each person special. And so our memory verse is so beautiful. It is, so God created man in its in his in own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 127. It is going to be an incredible vacation Bible school. It starts at 615, and it starts just before the meeting. So the meeting starts at 630. Our music and our registration will start at 615. So the kids will have a place to go while the grown-ups are in here learning more about Jesus. Anyway, hope you will share this with your friends and neighbors. It's going to be a really great, a really great program. On this little card in the foyer, you can pick them up. There's a QR code and you can show this to your friends and they can just take their smartphones and go right to the link and sign up their kids um, on this link, on this little flyer. So that's why these were created. And then also, if you're interested in helping us, we would love that so much. Just call me. You have my number if you go to church here. Or you can as well go to this QR code, and it's a place, there's a place for volunteers to sign up. And I would just love your support. Thank you so much. And by the way, we'll, just one more quick thing. This is only going to go for the first week of the meetings. After the first week, there will be child care. But there won't be a... a, a absolutely incredible program. We're going to have crafts and we're going to have um, a, a drama, Bible drama and music and it's going to be a lot of fun. But that first week of the meetings is the most important week to get the families out. So please um, just pass the word. Thank you. That is going to be a super fun program. Again, if you are interested in helping out, please talk to Sherilyn. Follow that QR code. It's also in the back of your bulletins. Um, so pull out your phones. You know, and your camera, take you straight there. Uh, the last quick announcement is tomorrow, starting at 9 a.m. Did I get that right? Where's 9 a.m.? All right, I'm getting head nods, so I think I got that right. Uh, we are having a yard cleanup to help our church look even better uh, in, before these evangelistic series start. And just as a quick, did you guys notice we have new windows? Don't those look great? We are so excited. So we're getting a lot of big changes. It's very exciting. Um, and yeah, we hope you have a great Sabbath, that you are able to worship here, and like we mentioned before, that you can rejoice in all that God has done for you. For 421. For all. 
saints who from their labors rest, who thee by faith before the world confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. have called us saints. And though we wait for the day when you will arrive, give us courage, give us hope, give us love, that we can share your message with all the world, that when people see us, they don't look at us, but rather they see you and all that we do. We ask that you continue to be with us today Open our hearts and our minds to the message this morning. And we love you. Come soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So this morning, our offering is for the church budget. We um, have been doing things a little bit differently, like many of you know. So we won't be passing around a plate, but in the back foyer, there is a little box that you can put in uh, any tithe and offering envelopes you have, as well as if you look in the back of your bulletin, there is a QR code so you can give right from your phone. Thank you so much for your continued support, and let's have a quick word of prayer. Dear God, we know that you own everything. As it says in the Psalms, the cattle of a thousand hills are yours, all the silver and all the gold. And yet, you have invited us to be part of your mission. You have invited us to give of ourselves to further your work. Thank you for that privilege. Thank you for the ability to join in 
a gospel mission. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. this time uh, the children will go go and pick up the offering and uh, as they walk about the uh, church sanctuary Good morning, boys and girls. I have a, thank you for saying good morning to me. I have a super hard question for you. Are you ready for it? Okay, listen up really good. What happened on November 1, 1843? What do you think, Trey? It's a hard question. And it's a little bit of a trick question, I'll tell you right off. Isabella? 
you're close. There was something that happened about 10 years before that that was like a meteor shower. Trey, this is hard, man. I don't think anybody in the whole church knows. No, it's even harder than that. I don't think anybody's even heard of it. I don't think you could find one person in this whole congregation that knows. But I'm going to tell you. Are you ready? Okay. On November 1, 1843, there were a group of people who kept the Sabbath. Do you think they were Seventh-day Adventists? No, there wasn't any Seventh-day Adventists then. But there were people who were Adventists. That meant they looked forward to Jesus coming, right? But there were some other people that kept the Seventh-day Sabbath holy, like we do. But they weren't Seventh-day Adventists. You know what they were? They were Seventh-day Baptists. And they loved the Holy Sabbath day of God so much that they wanted everybody to know. But they were just a little group. There were only about 5,000 of them in the whole country. And so you know what they did on November 1, 1843? They said, we're going to fast and pray to Jesus that the almighty God will reveal the Sabbath to the whole world. But they were just a little group. Do you know what it means to fast? What does it mean, Isabella? Yeah, people fast in different ways. Some people don't eat anything when they pray to God so that they won't be thinking about eating. They'll be thinking about praying. And other people just eat real simply, like maybe plain bread with no peanut butter on it and raisins and water, you know, something like that. But here are these people. They prayed all day long. Oh, Lord God Almighty, reveal the seventh-day Sabbath to the whole world. Do you think God heard their prayer? Oh, God always hears our prayers. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no, sometimes he says wait, or maybe. But he always hears them. But there was a lady up in New York. Her name was Rachel Oaks. And she thought, you know, my daughter's only 18 years old, and she's teaching down in this mountain village in Washington, New Hampshire. I think I'll go live with her for the winter because Mrs. Oaks's husband had died. So she was a widow. So she came down, and she was a Seventh-day Baptist. She was part of this group that were praying that the Lord God Almighty would reveal the Seventh-day Sabbath to the whole world. But when she got to this little mountain village in Washington, New Hampshire, and I've been there several times myself, there was nobody keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. So she and her daughter, Delight, stayed at home. They were, they were living in a big farmhouse owned by a guy named William Farnsworth. You need to remember that name because it's going to come into this story. And they kept the Sabbath at home, and they sang, and they prayed, and they went for walks, and they visited the sick like we all do on the Sabbath day, right? And then on Sunday, for fellowship and to, and to sing with other people and read the Bible, they went to church on Sunday. Well... The first day that Mrs. Oaks went to church on Sunday in this church, they had a a visiting pastor. He was a circuit rider. Anybody know what a circuit rider is? He rides a horse from one church to the next. So he'd come 18 miles on his horse that morning, and he was preaching away. And all of a sudden, he said something that made Mrs., Mrs. Oaks just sit up in her chair. What was it? Well, she didn't say anything. But when the pastor came to visit her that afternoon at William Farnsworth's big farmhouse, she said, Elder Wheeler, while you were speaking, I could hardly contain myself. Why, you said we should keep all of the Ten Commandments, and you yourself break one of them. Oh, my. Pastor Wheeler was startled. Whatever could she mean? And he said to her, Why, Sister Oaks, whatever do you mean? She said, Pastor Wheeler, you keep the Pope Sunday instead of the Lord's Sabbath. Why, Pastor Wheeler went home, and he told one of his friends, Nothing has ever stabbed me in the heart, stabbed my heart with thoughts like that lady's words to me. So he began studying his Bible. Study, study, study all winter. And about March, he decided that the seventh day Saturday was the Sabbath of the Lord his God. And he started keeping the Sabbath and studying with people, not in the little Washington, New Hampshire church, 
but studying with them in the farmer's house where Dwight, uh, Dwight was and her, her mom and a few other people came to study about the Sabbath. And one day, while Pastor Wheeler was preaching in the Sunday church, one of his kids, and you know how many kids he had? 22. 22 children. When one of his children, who was a little bit older than you are, probably about 18 or 19, he stood right up in church. Can you imagine somebody just standing right up in church? And he said, I have decided to keep the Lord's Sabbath day every Saturday instead of the Pope's Sunday. Everybody goes, what? And then his brother that was sitting over here on the other side of the church, his name was Cyrus, and he stood up and said, I too want to keep holy the Lord's seventh day Sabbath. Oh my, Mrs. Oaks was really a missionary. People were already keeping the Sabbath. But that's not the end of the story. The pastor, Pastor Wheeler, who was now keeping the seventh day Sabbath, told his friend, his friend's name was Thomas Preble, and his friend wrote books. And his friend wrote a little book on the Sabbath and why the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And you know who got the little book? The three people who started the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Joseph Bates. Anybody know the next one? Who? Yes, he was a sailor. Who, Cody? Yes, Ellen, Joseph Bates, the sailor. Ellen White and her husband. Anybody know her husband's name? James, yes, James. Those three got this little booklet, and it wasn't very long before they studied that Sabbath day question for themselves, and they began keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath. Now, kids, that was just a few people back there in 1844. Do you know how many Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath keepers there are today? 21 million. She was really a missionary, Mrs. Oaks, wasn't she? Even though she never thought that 21 million people would start keeping the Seventh-day Sabbath, it, this was the answer to the prayer of those faithful Seventh-day Advent, Seventh-day Baptists who fasted and prayed for a whole day and said, Lord God Almighty, reveal the Sabbath day to many, many people. And you know, kids, every week when you come to Sabbath school and when you come to church, you are revealing the Sabbath day. You're revealing that you love Jesus enough to show him your loyalty by worshiping him on Sabbath day. You are a missionary just like Rachel Oaks. I'm so glad you came to church today, but it doesn't make just my heart happy. It makes Jesus' heart happy. Would you like to help me pass these out? I'll go to that side, and you go to this side. When you get your little paper, you can go back to your seats. We invite those of you who are able to kneel with us.
Dear God, you have done so much for us. You have blessed us with the Sabbath, a time to take a deep breath and rest, to remember that we are human, and to put away for a brief 24-hour period all of the cares and struggles of the week. And so this morning, we thank you for that. Lord, we know that there are many people here who are facing problems, personal struggles, and so we just want to take a moment to give those up to you. We want to thank you for those who have been healed in our church family, for Sue Proen's successful knee replacement, for Jenny McKenzie's improvement following her surgery, for Jody Erickson's new job. And yet you know that this world is hard and that there are struggles as well. And we just pray for those that are sick, those who are encountering difficulties, that they may remember that you love them, that you are watching out for them, and that you are coming soon. And Lord, as we prepare ourselves for this evangelistic series, we ask that our hearts might be opened. We believe that the Holy Spirit is here in this valley working, that he's preparing the minds and hearts of people to receive this message that you have given us. And so we ask that we might be inclined to listen, that we might be able to discern the movement of where the Holy Spirit has already been and join in to bring others into a saving relationship with you. Please guide our thoughts and our actions, our words as we speak to those around us, that we may breathe life, and that as we leave, that the places we've been may smell a little bit more like heaven. We ask that you be with us today Incline our hearts to worship, and we love you. Come soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church family. And if you were a visitor, we welcome you and hope that you will be blessed and that you will come back and worship with us on a regular time. And we also welcome all those who are visiting us online. And may you be blessed also. I recently read a story of a a young girl called Lisa. At the age of four, she lost her parents in an automobile accident. And her only living relative was her grandfather who took her into his home. As a result of the trauma that she experienced, Lisa was very quiet and a loner. The grandfather did everything that he could in getting her the necessary help to overcome her insecurities. He provided the best possible home for her. But when she became of age, she decided to leave and live with her boyfriend. The grandfather kept in touch with her, but the encounters were short and abrupt by her. The only time that she initiated contact with him was when she needed some money. The grandfather didn't like the choices that she was making and had great concern for her well-being. And then he was hospitalized. And when he was released, he needed someone to care for him for several months at his home during his recovery. Now the grandfather was, was uh, in a different situation. The shoe was on the other foot now. When Lisa was explained that the medical staff, she could not see her being a caregiver. She had too many problems and, I was, and she refused. The grandfather was greatly disappointed. Sometime later, Lisa received a letter from her grandfather's attorney to make an appointment with him, for her grandfather had passed away and had left the whole estate to her. She was alarmed that her grandfather passed away, but excited about the possibility of receiving the inheritance of his estate. She was thought now I could pay off all my bills and get out of debt. At the appointment, she was given a handwritten letter to her from her grandfather. The letter was very direct. He stated that he believed she could do anything that possible if she put her mind to it and stayed with it that he was disappointed in her choices and that she only contacted him when she needed money. She was selfish and he was greatly hurt by her refusal to care for him during his recovery. He ended the letter assuring her that he loved her greatly and was leaving all of his estate to her. She shed some tears and felt some guilt, but was eagerly waiting to hear how much she was going to get. The attorney addressed her that this was a most unusual will, and it was the first of its kind that he officiated over. To receive the inheritance, she would need to fulfill three things. Otherwise, the entire estate would go to charity. The first thing she had to do was to live in the grandfather's house for a year and maintain it. The second, she was to volunteer to a community service program. And third, she was to get a job from a list of companies that her grandfather had provided. She never thought that she could fulfill these requirements But after pausing for a moment, 
She recalled the grandfather's letter. He believed he, she could do anything if she stayed with it. She was determined to fulfill this requirement. And after the year was completed, she fulfilled all the requirements, and she was a different person as a result of it. From volunteering, she became compassionate, caring, and less self-centered. From working, she became responsible, got satisfaction from accomplishments, and experienced a team camaraderie with the help, helpers. And with her earnings, she was able to pay off her debts. And living in the grandfather's home, she realized how much her grandfather sacrificed and loved her. She returned to the attorney's office to receive inheritance. There was another person in the office with the attorney with his back to her. The attorney was about to introduce the person and the individual turned around. Lisa was shocked. She was angry. It was the grandfather who played dead for the benefit of her grandfather's well-being. And he asked her one question. Are you a better person as a result of the past year? And she agreed and also of her grandfather's great love for her, to go through the charade on the benefit of her. Before we get into this morning's message, let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we invite you to be present. We ask that you open our minds put the distractions out of us. And may we hear the things that we need to hear. And speak through me. And may I be invisible and the people see you. In Christ's name, amen. Our message this morning is found in John 13. And a partial companion is found in Luke 22. But our, we're going to be looking at specifically John 13. The Passover was appointed to pay a tribute to the deliverance of Israel from the bondage of Egypt. This ordained event was to be a reminder to the people of this, their miraculous emancipation from the servitude. Likewise, the Christian community has a reminder of their liberation from the bondage of sin from our Savior's death in the communion service. It, too, is to be a great reminder of the great sacrifice he has done for us. If you were to describe Jesus in two words, what two words would you use? For me, Two words that come to mind are humility and service. A quality of himself that he described in the statement, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. A quality of character that the twelve disciples did not learn during their three, year, three and a half years of walking the dusty roads of ministry with him. To get this quality of character across to his disciples, Jesus gave a powerful teaching illustration that would perpetually be deeply embedded on their hearts and minds. And hopefully, it will do the same to each of us also. I would like us to imagine the scene of the Last Supper between Christ and his 12 disciples as described in John 13. Before entering the upper room, there was agitation among the group. Luke informs us that the disciples had been disputing which of them is the greatest. A 
Upon their entry, there was pushing and shoving as they seated themselves. John and Judas managed to outmaneuver the equally aggressive Peter as Judas gained the seat to Jesus' left and John to his right. Each desired the most prominent position around the table. Tensions continued to fill the room after their seating. There was something missing. In place was the water pitcher, the basin, and the towel. But there was no servant to wash their feet, as was the custom. Walking the roads and dirt paths, travelers' feet would become dusty in the dry season and the muddy during the wet. Animal waste found everywhere on the street and path. On such festival occasions, a servant would wash the participants' feet. But there was no servant. Each disciple was determined that he would not assume that humiliating role as their eyes gazed around the table for the first movement towards the instruments of service. Aware of the undercurrent, Jesus observed and waited to see what they would do. The tenseness of the air became suffocating as no one made a move to serve another. In that explosive setting, the master teacher was going to tutor his followers and set an example. In verses 4 and 5, it, it's written, he rose and laid aside his gar garment and girded himself with towel. After that, he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them. Peter was uncomfortable enough from beating, being beaten out of the two most prominent ta uh, table sites. And now he watched mystified as Jesus served one disciple after another. As Jesus approached Peter's feet, he was confused. And not what, knowing what to say, he blurted out, You shall not wash my feet. Jesus asserted that he was doing what was essential. And if Peter would not allow him to serve him, then he had no place as his follower. Bewildered, the ever verbal disciple, not knowing what else to say, declared that Jesus should wash not only his feet, but all of him. Let's read what Jesus' response to Peter was in verse 10. And Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Peter did not need a complete bath, but only a cleansing of his dirty feet. We fail to see the importance and significance of Christ's words if we only view them in terms of a physical bathing. The words contain a level of spiritual meaning. Verse 10 contains two kinds of spiritual cleansing. The first, the full body bath, represents the full cleansing from sin at ba baptism. At that point, a convert is forgiven of all sin and justified in the eyes of Jesus. Having been submerged in the watery grave of baptism, the new Christian is clean all over. The second spiritual meaning of Jesus' words 
or the foot washing representing the ongoing cleansing needed after baptism. A new believer moves through life in their daily business. They make sinful contact with the world and its contaminants. Worse yet, they make mistakes and commit sins. Such individuals have not apostatized or left Christ. Therefore, they do not need another full baptism. In a manner of speaking, they have messed up their spiritual feet in their journey and need a partial cleansing from time to time. We should regard the foot washing service in part as a mini baptism. It is a time in which individuals are cleansed and rededicate their lives in Jesus as the Lord of their lives. They renew their vows of servanthood to the world around them and to fellow church members. One of the more curious features of the history of the church is that the religious institutions and Christians have placed a larger emphasis on the part of the Last Supper that deals with the bread and the wine, but have almost totally neglected the foot washing. Yet Jesus commands both. There are probably good reasons for that. After all, the death of Christ and his shed blood are central to what Christianity is all about. As a result, the broken bread representing Christ's body and the wine symbolizing his shed blood deserve an important part, place in Christianity. But there is something else of importance in Jesus' teaching and example. That is the need of his followers to be spiritually ready to partake of the communion service and its symbols. Just as Christ's first disciples needed to be humble and examine their hearts before eating the communion meal, so likewise contemporary disciples must prepare their hearts and minds for the experience. However, most of us moderns do not like the idea of washing someone's feet any more than Peter did. Listen to the words that are penned in Desire of Ages. Page 650, paragraph 3. The ordinance is Christ's appointed preparation for the sacramental service while pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. We are not prepared to receive the communion of his body and his blood. Therefore, it was that Jesus appointed the memorial of his humiliation to be first observed. For me, I have discovered this service to be a blessing. It is not only an occasion of service to another person, but also an opportunity to confess my wrong and shortcomings to both God and other people. I have partic- participated in four ordinances of humility, humility in India, which have made the service even more meaningful to me. We of the Western world live pretty much in a sterile environment. We come to this service with clean and pedicure feet, whereas the people of India travel to their church on dusty, contaminated pathways and roads, often without footwear or just tongue sandals. On each occasion, I had an Indian partner which provided me a better understanding of what that first service was like 2,000 years ago. I recall the first occasion in India. It was my first year there. And after Pastor Patsa gave a, a moving message, we were dispersed to go into 
the and participate in the foot washing. <clears throat> My partner and I, as we walked out of the sanctuary, we were appalled. We saw on the doorways of two rooms the letters USA on one and on the other India. We looked at each other and said, what is this? We're brothers. We're sisters. And we said, we ignored the USA. And we were going over to the room with India. And there was a, a deacon there and uh, tried to explain to us your room was over there. And we said, no. We are brothers. We're sisters. And we proceeded to go into the room that was labeled India. That event brought to mind of Paul's rebuke of Peter in Galatians 2. Peter mingled with the Gentiles, but when certain influential leaders came from Jerusalem, Peter separated himself from the uncircumcised group. The gospel is not simply in an individualistic way of getting right with God. It is much more than that. The vertical relationship with God has many more horizontal implications for our relationship with others. That first communion service, I should say, the first ordinance of humility service in India was very impactful for me. As I washed my brother's feet, I felt the coarseness and the roughness of walking the roads without sandals. They were dirty. And it was a beautiful experience. I understood what it was like when Jesus washed the feet of each of his disciples. Then I had another experience. When I came here to Yakima to be principal in 90 and 91, I had many things on my mind that I had to deal with coming in at the school. And I had people calling me, and I had one person in particular that called me and uh, told me that his daughter has some wonderful underwater photography that would be good for his daughter to come in and present to the children. And I thanked them. But being busy with some things, I forgot about it. And it was about 15 years later, this person said to me, you know, after working with you for a while, you're not a bad guy. But I disliked you for many years because I didn't respond to him. And so what I did is, the next time we had communion service, I invited him to be my partner. And it was a wonderful experience, and we made amends and right with each other, and we've had a beautiful relationship. That's what the ordinance of humility is all about. We all as humans have pride. 
And we all have offended others in our families and in our church. The foot washing experience is a time to be humble and to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a time of spiritual renewal, a time to find others whom we have wronged, a time to make peace with them and the Lord. Simply, it's a season of spiritual renewal symbolized by a mini-baptism. Most important, it prepares us to sit at the Lord's table, both in heart and mind as a healed community who have messed up our feet in the journey of life. In preparation for the communion service next week, I recommend that you read over the first 17 verses of John 13 and then read the companion parallel, which is not as informative as John 13, but Luke 22. I also would suggest that you read in Desire Ages, chapter 71, The Servant of Servants, and also chapter 72, In Remembrance of Me. As you prepare to participate in this event that has been sanctioned by our Lord. I'd like to close with a reading from one of my favorite Bible passages. It's found in Philippians, and I want to read it out of the Good News translation because I like the way it's written, how it's worded. But I'm going to read the first verse in the English Standard Version because I don't like the Good News translation as much and then the rest in the Good News Translation. Listen carefully as you prepare for next week's service. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affections and sympathy, I urge you then to make me completely happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same, same love, and being one in soul and mind. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from cheap desires or boast, but be humble towards one another. Always consider others better than yourselves. And look out for another's interest not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ had. He always had the nature of Christ, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He has humbled and walked the paths of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven and on earth and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we want to praise you for the example you have set and what you went through so that we may have life. 
may we lean on you. May we let you lead and guide us. May we put aside our differences. May we be humble and meek and servant as you are, as you have demonstrated. As we prepare for this service next week, may we meditate on your life. May we become more like you and willing to serve one another, even the washing of feet. In Christ's name, amen.